We don't know what we don't know, but I will say that what I've been encouraged by when I look at the numbers closely is, yeah, you had the initial spike of what I call the looky lose, you know, the family members or friends that you reached out on Facebook and you're like, what in the hell are these guys doing? But what you see is there's a significant number of people watching all the episodes, including the ones that are being released. Are you looking for ways to shorten your marketing learning curve and help your organization survive and thrive? Welcome to Relish This, the Purpose Marketing Podcast, a show for purpose-focused leaders who want to use marketing techniques to fuel their organization's growth. If you're a returning listener and you haven't subscribed already, we'd love to have you. Also, please consider leaving a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Now here's your host, author and marketing specialist, Stu Swinefort. Hey, everybody, Stu here. My guests today are Tony Lupo and Ryan Fairfield, and they are the co-founders of the Warrior Next Door podcast, which is this great new podcast that you should check out. It's a collection of interviews that they have completed over the last like 17 years with veterans of World War to start. And it's just a really great show, as well as a really great idea. And we chatted about how we can help their show reach the widest audience, things that they can do to avoid pitfalls of podcasting and just podcasting in general. If you're interested in starting a podcast, I think this is a great show and check out The Warrior Next Door. Here we go. Tony and Ryan, welcome to the show. Good to be here. Thanks for inviting us, Stu. Yeah, this was great. Thanks, Stu. Well, I'm really excited to have you both on the show. You were introduced to me through Megan Hotman who's a longtime friend of mine, and she has a podcast herself called Maximum Enthusiasm that uh, Relish Studio, my business, helps do the editing and we're a sponsor of. So it's really cool to have other podcasters on the show today. It's super fun for me. Yeah, when we kick this off, so I ride bikes with Megan, and as people who listen to her podcast may know, she's an advocate for cyclists and as a lawyer. And I was telling her about this idea to have a podcast with some of the work that Ryan and I did with the Library of Congress interviewing World War II veterans. And she immediately said, you need to get a hold of this guy. Stu's done a lot of good work for me, as she said, kind of getting the social media part of her podcast going. So yeah, I'm glad we had a chance to get introduced. And I'm really happy that you invited us on your podcast today. Well, you're welcome. I'm I'm really excited to learn a little bit more about The Warrior Next Door. It's a really cool concept. I've listened to a couple of shows. I know you've published about nine episodes at the time of this recording. So I think that there'll probably be more than that. But Ryan, can you tell us a little bit about how The Warrior Next Door came to be? Well, Tony and I have been involved with interviewing World War II veterans primarily for almost 20 years. And all of these interviews have been archived at the Library of Congress through the Veterans History Project. And so anyone can go and watch those videos there on that website at the Library of Congress. But we felt like there needed to be more done with these interviews. They're just kind of just, you know, out there. But we wanted to try to do something different, you know, and we discussed, should we write a book? What should we do? And Tony had a great idea of exploring the idea of doing a podcast. And that's really where the whole thing started. I think it was almost exactly a year ago that he and I met at his house and we're having a beer. And he said, how about we do a podcast instead of writing a book? And and that's just where it all really started. So it's almost exactly a year ago that idea really nucleated. Oh, that's great. Do you have anything to add, Tony? Yeah. So the main thing is we knew from the minute we started recording these veterans experiences, these oral histories back in 2003. We knew we wanted to make sure that it was important to the veterans that we interviewed that their story be shared. The reason they sat down and allowed us to interview them is they felt like that period of history, World War II, for example, the Great Depression, and even the Cold War afterwards that a lot of these men were involved in and women really wasn't getting the attention it deserved. If you think about how much that period of history has uh, affected everything that's happened since then, it was you know, one of the large, I mean, it's right up there with Thermopylae. World War II will be discussed thousands of years from now if we don't kill ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> it will be discussed thousands of years from now in the same breath as Thermopylae and some of these other major battles of history that have occurred and how it changed the course of human history. So we really wanted to find a, an outlet for that. And I just felt like a podcast was a, a, a good way to do it. And the other thing that was important for us to is there's a lot of podcasts and books written about the generals, the presidents, the war heroes. But what we were amazed by is it really didn't matter what these veterans did during the war. 
it was enlightening. It was compelling. It was interesting. So one of the things that we're focusing on our podcast and the reason we call it The Warrior Next Door is we want to be able to show people that it didn't matter what role you had during this period of history, during World War II, it was intriguing. It was relative to today's ears, kind of exotic and compelling. And we hope that we capture that with the commentary that we add to the podcast that helps augment the veteran stories. Yeah, that was one of the things I found just really neat about how you were tackling these interviews in the podcast format was you two interject in the interview. So instead of just having a single interview that just plays out during the show, you're kind of pausing and, and reflecting about what was going on when the veteran that you were interviewing was talking or give a little context in terms of history or you know all of those kinds of things that just brought a lot more flavor to it than if it was just, you know, listen to you know, some gentlemen talk for 45 minutes. So I really like that format. How did you come up with that, that approach? So one of the things that I noticed is as much as Ryan and I enjoyed interviewing, you know, almost 200 veterans, I couldn't sit down and just listen to a veteran share their stories for an hour without kind of shaking like a dog on point, like, oh man, they, you know, when he says this, I wonder if people know that they're talking about this thing and the other thing, something simple. For example, we had an interview with a guy, Ira Buley, who we will hear end of season one this year, who flew in Avenger bombers during the war and talked about how terrible napalm was. And I don't think a lot of people know that napalm was developed by Harvard University, the bastion of higher learning. And in fact, not only was it developed by Harvard University, but it was tested in their football fields or a field offsetting it. <laughs> no way. <laughs> yeah, and that places like MIT, Stanford, and, and whatnot during World War II, you know, were all participating in this war effort. I mean, today you couldn't imagine a Harvard University with their position that they take on various things that they focus on generating something as terrible as napalm, but back in World War II, they did. So these are the sort of things that we try to add to try to bring people not only to the time that they were there and what was going on while they were engaged in this Herculean World War, but also to add some color and context and maybe enlighten people to some of the things that they were involved in that they just touch on in a very cursory matter. What are your thoughts on this, Ryan? Yeah, I was just going to say, most everyone that listens to our podcast isn't, you know, as well versed or I guess as much of a nerd with World War II history as Tony and I are. <laughs> Just uh, knowing what certain terms mean, like what is 1A? You know, like whenever you're actually going to get a physical to go into the military during the war, you're classified 1A or 4F or something in between. 4F means you're rejected and 1A means you're physically fit to go into training. Right. There are a lot of people that don't understand things like that. So what we try to do is just add color, you know, try to explain things as we go along to kind of put some sort of context to what the veterans talking about and, and everything. And, you know, I think that from the feedback I've heard from a lot of people, they really enjoy that aspect of it. And there are a lot of people that have thanked me, actually, for explaining some of the terminology and helping them understand what's going on. So that's kind of what we're there to do besides just make fools of ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> well, I certainly don't think that you're doing that. The episodes I've list I have listened to have been enlightening. And like you just mentioned, Ryan, you know, people who haven't been in the military don't understand all the acronyms. And, you know, the U.S. military is renowned for, you know, it takes you a year to figure out what the heck anyone's saying just because there's so much jargon and whatnot. So, and these veterans do speak in those terms a lot. So it's really cool to get a little bit of an insight into it. You know, I think back about HBO's Band of Brothers, which was really just an amazing series that followed, you know, kind of not the typical people that get followed in war movies or whatever you want to call those TV shows, I guess. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there's just, there's all sorts of stories out there. Like my grandfather served in North Africa during World War II. I think he was like a quartermaster or something. So he, I don't think he actually saw any, you know, action, but everybody has this role that they played in these campaigns. And I think it's really valuable to get those stories out there. I'm excited that you guys are doing that. Well, the other thing that we want to do, Stu, eventually, if this podcast continues to grow, is we want to have the capability to have people like you or others call in and share these stories of their grandparents, of their fathers or whatever with what they did, whether it was World War II, Korea, Vietnam, whatever. You know, 
people have a sense of history. People are, I'm proud of what my dad did in the Vietnam War with the U.S. Navy. I've got some photos right here that I was looking at. And I think a lot of people are, you know, it was, it was a sacrifice. They weren't out just, you know, going to frat parties and getting drunk, which is what they actually were fighting for. They were fighting <laughs> for our ability to go out and do those things. But the bottom line is, is that these guys, you know, sacrifice, you know, four or five years of their lives. And people like to share that story. The other thing, with the Band of Brothers that was compelling was the cinematography really brought people to understand what these men really experienced and how violent it was. Well, we try to do that with our podcast as well. And in fact, we may have succeeded a bit too well because we've gotten some feedback recently from our Harvey Hunt episodes, who was a, a Marine who uh, landed on four islands in the Pacific, that some of the details, some of the descriptions of combat were disturbing. And when we were making the podcast, we wanted to not put in, you know, gratuitous stories of violence. But at the same time, we wanted to kind of let people know and not hide from them some of the violence that they were experienced to. And I thought it was a little bit flattering that some of my friends were texting me and saying, hey, Lupo, you need to put something in front of these before I listened to a couple of them, because I was a little disturbed when I pulled into my parking lot in the morning. So we hope that we can also do that as well, is to bring, kind of do a, an audio version of Band of Brothers, where we focus on the average GI and their experiences in a way that people can relate to it and feel like they experienced it, at least to some degree. Yeah, I think that it's interesting how sensationalized the depiction of war can get. And I think we do tend to fall into this trap of seeing all the technology and all the action and thinking, oh, this is cool. But, you know, it's not, you know, people are dying. Yes. And so getting those stories across and, you know, I think achieving that balance is is a good thing to strive for. I'm, I'm excited to hear that you guys are doing that. Yeah, we don't glorify war at all. We say over and over again during our podcast that it's terrible that these men and women experienced this, but they did. And other people need to know how terrible it is. So we don't continue to fall into that trap. Mm -hmm. You know, Ryan, what's your comment on that as well? I know that you and I have spent a lot of time talking about what to leave in, how raw to leave these. What are your thoughts on it? Well, we want to make sure that the veteran's experiences, in his own words, are preserved and are not forgotten. And as gritty as that may be. And that's kind of, I think, something Tony and I agreed upon very early, which is, we need to make sure that we don't, you know, that we leave the accounts of these guys intact as much as possible and try to make sure that we can convey what, what's going on here. We want everyone to understand this history and what has gone on. And really, that three years and eight months that we were in that war has benefited our country. And all a lot of the things that we take for granted today are a direct result from that, that nearly four-year-long struggle that we were in. So we want to just kind of keep bringing attention to the fact that, you know, what, what these guys went through, men and women, women on the home front that were in the waves, for instance, or the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, or just Rosie the Riveter in the factories working. They all have a story and everyone sacrificed. And it was such a great esprit de corps back then in this country for everyone to have pitched in the way they did. And we just think it's remarkable. So, yeah. Yeah, well. I think we look at it through the lens of U.S. citizens. That's the three of us all live live here in the States. And I'm assuming you, you both grew up here, as I did. So, you know, all of it is in that context of how it affected us here in the States. You know, and these are just some of those stories. And it was truly a worldwide effort. These similar stories, I'm sure, could be echoed from people in other countries as well. Mm hmm. Yeah. And, and the other thing that we get from these interviews is we also, not every time, but a lot of the times we'll get a bit about their, their history prior to the war. And these men and women were children of the Great Depression. And some of the stories that they share with us, I mean, it's not uncommon for us to interview people who grew up in a sod grass house in Oklahoma, mm -hmm. dirt floors, and who would harvest or not harvest, but would manage their farm with mules and mechanical implements. I think the thing about this period of history that is really also overlooked, I think, and maybe not appreciated, is a lot of these men and women went from a place where they never rode in a car because they couldn't afford it because of the Great Depression. And a year later, they're flying 
a B-24 over towns in Europe or the Pacific that they never heard of before. I mean, you like, you know how SpaceX nowadays is bringing people up into space and it feels really exotic. It would have been that sort of change in technology to go from a farm living on dirt floors to a year later driving a tank across Europe or flying in a B-17. I mean, that's the other thing that these men and women share with us was this acceleration of technology and they're exposed to things that were completely foreign to them. Yeah. I mean, going from like having experienced none of that to piloting the you know, best technology on the planet at that time. Like, that's, that's a remarkable leap. It is. And in fact, the interview that I'm doing research for right now, the veteran, William Bratton, he talks about that. He went to an Indian school in Oklahoma and, you know, a year later, He's an advanced radar operator in an airplane, an Avenger, bombing targets in Tokyo Bay. I mean, you know, and he keeps talking about how it was just mind boggling for him. There were times where he just couldn't believe what was going on. It was happening so fast. Yeah, it's amazing. Those are just incredible stories. So I know that you've had a lot of success just immediately upon launch of this show. So run me through the numbers real quick. How many episodes have dropped and how many downloads have you gotten, et cetera? I think we've got our fourth Harvey Hunt episode, and we've had four Alan Sr. episodes. That's the entire Alan Sr. series. So we've got eight episodes drop, and right now we're approaching a total of 800 downloads, and we've, we launched on September the 15th. So we're about three weeks in, I guess. Almost, yeah, three weeks ago today, I think is what it was. So it's been real exciting, and as always, you watch these numbers and at first, there's the big, huge tsunami of excitement and stuff, and then it kind of <laughs> it tails off a bit. But, you know, like I was talking to a listener actually at a conference this week, and he was saying, you know, that we're not, not to get discouraged because now you're settling back into a rhythm of, of the people who are really the base listeners, and it'll just start snowballing. And we're kind of seeing that, you know, we're seeing the base level, the floor of our listeners kind of it's starting to swell a bit. So it's been really interesting, and it's new for both Tony and I. Neither of us have ever done this. This is our very first attempt at this. So we're kind of feeling our way through it. <laughs> yeah, we don't know what we don't know. But I will say that what I've been encouraged by when I look at the numbers closely is, yeah, you had the initial spike of what I call the looky-loos, you know, the family members or friends that you reached out on Facebook, and they're like, what in the hell are these guys doing? But what you see is there's a significant number of people watching all the episodes including the ones that are being released. Now we've got uh, people in Australia, in Germany, who are watching, you know, multiple episodes. I mean, what would really scare me is if we had that big spike at the beginning and then nothing, meaning people didn't feel impelled to listen to the second, the third, the fourth episodes. But, and not only that, over the three weeks, I'm seeing those later episodes, like in the first installment with Alan Sr., which is four episodes long. He's a B-24 waist gunner. Mm -hmm. I'm starting to see the second, third, and fourth episodes starting to catch up to that very first episode. So I'm really excited. It feels like it's starting to stick a little bit, but we definitely, we're a far cry away from where we need to be on the marketing side, which is one of the reasons why, you know, Megan pointed us towards you to to, to give us some ideas on that, because we still have a, a very, very long way to go, but I'm encouraged by our start. It actually has gone better than I thought it was going to go. Yeah, you got to help us, Stu. Please help yeah. us. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll give you a little bit of context. And th these are just a set of numbers that I was able to pull. So there may be some other metrics that would go against this particular measure. But some of the research that I did that said that if you get more than 26 downloads of an episode in its first week, then you're doing great. You're in about the top 50% of all podcasts. And if you get more than 72 in the first week, you're in the top 25% of podcasts. If you get over 230 in that first week, you're in that top 10%. And if you get over 539, you're in the top 5%. So I would certainly say that based on the numbers and the number of episodes, and the fact that you've only been doing this for three weeks, I would say that you're at least in that top 25, which is just a fantastic way to get this show kicked off, considering, again, that you haven't really done any marketing other than kind of putting it out there on Facebook. So kudos to you guys for you know knocking it out of the park, finding an interesting subject matter and doing a really good job of engaging people. I think you're looking at the right numbers. The fact that you are looking at, you know, kind of later episodes catching up to 
initial episodes that demonstrates that there's kind of a groundswell of uh, desire for this material. And so way to go. Yeah, we appreciate you sharing that with us. Ryan and I, we just didn't know what a successful launch looked like. For us, all we focused on was let's try to put some content out there that people would enjoy, that was listenable, that wasn't some historian droning on and on and some professorial voice about President Roosevelt. I mean, you know, people have heard that. People know who Winston Churchill and and these people are. We were hoping to keep it loose. I mean, I'm not going to lie to you. We sit back and we kind of have a beer or two before we kick off a podcast and we try to keep it relaxed and unpretentious. But at the same time, you know, we bust our butts making sure that we do the research and that what we say in the podcast is as accurate as it can be, given the fact that sometimes there's, you know, conflicting statistics for a certain thing we're covering. That's something we didn't know is, is this a successful launch? It, it felt like it, but I hadn't heard those figures before. And we don't have a web page yet. I think that's something we want to do. Facebook has been okay, but it's been kind of messy. Ryan and I are Facebook gurus. <laughs> so we did catch a lucky break. Can I talk about the Fox 31 thing at all, Stu? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So we did catch a lucky break by, I, I sent kind of a, a summary of the podcast to the news networks, the television networks in uh, Denver. And Fox 31 has agreed to basically do an episode I think they want to air it near Veterans Day Mm -hmm. on the work that we're doing. So this Friday, two days from now, I don't want to date this podcast, but we're going to have Fox 31 here recording Ryan and I recording a podcast and talk about what we're doing it. And we're really excited about that. But I still think, I don't feel like that that's Mount Olympus. I feel like it's just a start, a very small piece of this. And I think it could take a year for us to get to the point where we really understand how successful this really is. And and that's why we're really interested in hearing any of the marketing ideas that you or others have for us. Yeah, absolutely. So the other thing to keep in mind is that the podcast world appears to be very noisy, no pun intended, in that there are a lot of podcasts out there. However, when you start to really dig into the figures of podcasts, There's a crazy drop off after about the third episode. So if your show has managed to make it longer than three episodes, that puts you in like the top 70% of all podcasts or something. I believe I have that number incorrect, but it's a remarkable drop off from like people saying, let's start a podcast to actually making it to episode three or episode 10 or episode 20. And so one of the things that I always do recommend with people who are looking to start a podcast is to really consider being consistent and just committing to it and saying, you know, I'm going to do this for, I'm going to put out one episode a week for a year. And if you can do that, that actually puts you in a pretty good space in terms of longevity in the podcast world. So, you know, certainly there are people who've had shows for many, many years, and that's fantastic. However, you know, just creating that intention and committing to it, and then just getting good at hitting that commitment is going to take you a long way in the space. Well, I think that bodes well a bit for us because, you know, one of the things that Tony and I made sure of when we started recording these is we wanted to have a lot of padding in in the number of episodes so that, you know, if we are able to get together and record these, because I live in Tulsa, Tony lives in Denver, and we get together about every six weeks, either at my house or his house, to record these episodes. We haven't really been doing it online yet, but we've got about six months worth of episodes recorded and we're about a month in now and we're going to record some more this weekend. So hopefully we'll be on our way to being a year in the bucket with this, you know, uh, before too long. Yeah. So what is your intention? What's your rollout schedule? Just so I can get a a feel for, uh, so you've released eight episodes in three weeks. Yes. And I'm assuming that slows down. Yes. What we've been doing, so Tony wanted to, uh, when we first started doing this, it's like, let's go ahead and just release the entire four episode Alan Sr. series, just to kind of give everyone a flavor for what a whole series sounds like. And people can binge listen to it and stuff. And a few days later, we released the first two episodes of the eight part Harvey Hunt series. And then we settled into our routine, which is going to be just a weekly single episode every Monday. It'll drop after midnight on Monday morning. And that's what we're sticking to now. We're just going to you know, drop out one episode a week. 
Well, I think you guys actually nailed that. That's pretty close to perfect in terms of what we would recommend in terms of bringing a show to life. Basically doing a a mass dump of a a few episodes, you know, following that in your case where you have kind of new content or a new subject matter, you know, doing another kind of semi mass dump and then getting down to a kind of a scheduled rollout. So I think you nailed it. Good. One of the things that we struggled with, and I'd like to get your take on, was how long should these episodes be? You can have episodes like Hardcore History that can be three to six hours long, or you could have little 10 or 15 minute soundbite things. We knew we didn't want to do that. We wanted people to to spend some time you know, listening to this, maybe over a workout or a drive to work. So we kind of stuck to 30 to 45 minutes per episode. I mean, what's your opinion when people ask you how long should an episode be? What does that look like? Well, my annoying short answer is the right length. (laughs) (laughs) But I think that you're also doing a good job of hitting where I would land on that as well. It feels to me like the, you know, some of the most popular podcasts are kind of this commutable length which is tends to be in that 30 to 45 minute range. Now, that doesn't mean that if you have an episode that needs to go longer, that you can't. And if you have an episode that needs to go shorter, that you, you can't. That's where my, you know, kind of initial comment lands. But that 30 to 30 to 45 tends to be kind of a sweet spot that a lot of people try and hit. Cool. Yeah, I know Ryan and I wrestled quite a bit with the weekly schedule. I was against it. I was afraid we wouldn't be able to generate enough content with the times that we met. But something that we experienced was, you know, we started to find ways to generate quality content that was fun to generate, that didn't feel like a chore. It didn't feel like we were generating content just to do it. It was still fun. If this isn't fun, we're not going to do this. Mm -hmm. But we were able to do it more easily. We started optimizing certain things we were doing. I don't even think we're close to really fully optimizing it. But I presume that's probably something that you and other podcasters experience as well is they found ways to kind of generate to to identify places or procedures that allow them to generate contact more easily. Or does it just is it always really difficult? (laughs) Because it's (laughs) it's thinking, I mean, you know, for each hour of content, there's probably five hours of, of prep for us. Yeah, well, you're doing a little bit different type of show than a lot of people produce, because there is so much research. And then the other thing that's really unique about your show is the kind of this the the lumping together of certain certain interviews, right? Where you have a certain veteran that you're speaking with, and that could be four episodes or it could be eight episodes. And so it gives you some flexibility in terms of how you want to release that stuff. And I think that one thing that you could do if you want to is do either a weekly release at certain times of the year where instead of just being 52 weeks in a row, you drop the four for the first episode or the first interviewee, and then maybe wait, you know, a month and then drop the eight for the next guy. And, you know, it's really just setting up expectations. But I think in the first year, I would probably continue to do it on the schedule that you have. And then in subsequent years, what you could do is you kind of republish some of the older interviews and basically bring those back to life in terms of your marketing or even just create a new block of four and drop those again as kind of a callback to, you know, some of your favorite episodes or something like that. So you can get really creative. I I know that there is a, I think there's a podcast out there that intentionally has one episode a year and I can't remember the name of it, but it is really, really well received. It's incredibly valuable in terms of the material that's being conveyed. It's fairly niche and it's incredibly well researched. And, you know, people want more, but this is what that guy has decided to do. And so that becomes a successful podcast because people love it. And so I think if, you know, if people love it, you know, that's the true mark of success. But that's good to know because there's some content, there's some reunions that we went to that were focused around, say, a ship like USS New Orleans, where I don't really see that being something that we could do on a weekly basis. It it feels like we're going to tell the story of what happened to that ship through a bunch of different sailors' viewpoints on the ship. I would almost like to just release that out as one, you know, big, you know, like 12 or 14 week slug of interviews. So I like your advice for the first year, let's just get good content out there. Let's keep it consistent. Let's get people interested and then we can do special projects. Another question that I have for you 
is, you know, I think one of the things that makes our podcast unique is we interview these people. This isn't this isn't just us commentating on some book we read or some movie we watched. Mm-hmm. These are people that we got to know until many of them passed away. We would share Christmas cards together. It's a very personal thing. And we want to tell that story as well, but I'd like to get your feedback. I still want this to be about the vets and their stories, but do you think it would make sense at some point to share more about that journey on the podcast? Or do you think that that would diminish some of the veterans that we're trying to to feature by talking about our interviewing them? Well, I think that that would be really interesting supplemental material. So I don't think that that would be a disservice to, you know, to the interviews themselves, that type of interview could be. So for example, if you drop a 12 week series on this particular ship that you have a ton of information about, you know, there's a lot of research and a lot of planning and a lot of other stuff that goes into creating those, you know, that 12 episode series. And then you could take some period of time in between the drop of that to the next major section. And if you felt like dropping a couple episodes in there that just talked about your experience in the interview process or something else that is relevant. You know, you could bring on somebody and talk about veterans affairs. There are lots of different angles there that would be different, but valuable. That's where I think I would be testing those waters in terms of, are you delivering value to the listener? Okay. Yeah. Cause it is, it is part of the story. It is part of our journey, quite frankly. Mm-hmm. One Ryan and I are, are really proud of. And I think one of the things that we try to do with some of the episodes that are coming up is to encourage other people to do it, that there's nothing special about us. We're a couple of scientists who work in the energy sector who have a passion for this and, you know, spent and are still spending, but we have spent the past decade and a half or two decades, you know, collecting these firsthand personal accounts and we encourage other people to do it. And to me, some of the story is the journey, how we met these individuals. What was it like when we entered their home? Who was there? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I just kind of want to get your take on that. You know, it may be that you are able to tee up, you know, other focused on World War II right now, but, you know, you might want to expand into other... Other conflicts. Conflicts, yep. That's the word I was looking for. And just teeing that up for people so that they have an understanding of what that experience is like and in terms of sharing their story. You know, so I think that that supplemental material, for lack of a better word, has value. And whether it's to encourage other people to to have conversations with their aging parents or grandparents or encouraging people to go out and start their own Warrior Next Door style podcast, you know, if it's furthering the mission, which is to get these stories out there and to and to share these events before they're lost to, to history, you know, I think that that's a good mission to support in any any way that you can. Okay. What are some ideas that you'd have for us to, you know, reach a a, a larger audience? Right now, where we're sitting is all of it's been primarily word of mouth through text and email and Facebook. And that's it. So what other things do you recommend that we could do to help grow? Right. So the first thing is on your show, ask people to spread the word. And there are a couple ways that I would recommend doing that. One being just say, hey, if you like your show and you know, so, or you like our show and you know someone who you think might like it as well, please pass it along. But also podcasting is kind of fueled by reviews and ratings. And so, you know, encouraging your listeners to go to their, you know, their platform of choice and leave a review and a rating for your show would be fantastic. That's just going to help you start to rise to the top for searches about World War II, for searches about you know veterans interviews and things of that nature. I would also make sure that your profiles are completely built out in all of these places that your show is going to show up. And I'm pretty sure you're using Buzzsprout as your distribution platform. So just making sure that that's filled out as much as possible. And then when with some of the other platforms that Buzzsprout pushes to asks for additional information, just filling that in as much as possible, you know, and really telling that story in as many words as they give you to tell that story, I think is probably what's going to be beneficial from a keyword and a search perspective. So if you think of each of these platforms like Apple Music and, you know, Google Play and and all of these other venues, Spotify, those all are little mini search engines for podcasts and for audio. So leveraging as much leveraging your ability to provide as much information as possible in in there will help you get found. Those are kind of some of the first things I would recommend. Then people listen to 
people find podcasts by listening to other podcasts. And so making sure that you get out on to other podcasts would be a next good step, particularly if there is some sort of tie in to what you're doing. So, you know, for example, my show is hopefully people get a lot of information and really enjoy the show. It's there's not a great tie in other than, you know, most of us have some sort of connection to veterans. But if you can get on to shows that are doing something in the veteran space and just talk about your show, that's going to be incredibly valuable. And then if we seek to start to grow that audience even more, we can start doing things like advertising on some of these other shows that do have a good market crossover. Stu, that's a good segue there. That was the question I had whenever I've been looking, and you're correct, we are using Buzzsprout. And when I've been looking at their the monetization tab where you look at getting sponsors or you know product marketing, that sort of thing, I see a lot of the sponsor opportunities out there are other podcasts, actually. So you recommend that at what point should we be looking at with respect to, I guess, the only metric we have, which is downloads, you know, total downloads, at what point should we start looking at going from trying to do what we're doing now, which is appearing on your show, to maybe trying to advertise on other shows? Well, it's a good question. And I think that it depends on how much you want to invest or if you can get investors to help f fund some of those activities. I would say that you have enough episodes out there that getting onto some other shows to talk about your show is a viable free solution to start. You know, certainly some shows cost money to be a guest, but there are plenty out there that I think that you could tap into that would would be interested in this story. So it's really starting to do the research and finding ever increasingly popular podcasts to be a guest on would be part of the recommendations that I would make in terms of just getting the word out and you know spreading that as far as possible. So can you get us on Joe Rogan's show? <laughs> yeah, so exactly, that would be one that well, you never know. You know, it's interesting. A lot of times, I this isn't my saying, but the answer is always no if you don't ask, right? So if you just start putting feelers out there and know that you're going to get a lot of no's or... Or get ghosted. <laughs> yeah, or get ghosted or whatever. But just knowing that and putting some effort into, you know, again, setting an intention to, I'm going to reach out to five podcasts a week and see if they would like to have us on as, as a guest. And certainly looking at demographics. So that's where, you know, Joe Rogan's show might be demographically aligned. You know, but the start is really figuring out who you think your audience is and making sure that you start there in terms of the shows that you want to be on. Okay. I have kind of a sensitive issue. You can always delete this out later and not put in your podcast. But what about a lot of podcasts that I listen to with history and stuff? They swear a lot. They're dropping F-bombs and things. And during the course of recording, Ryan and I have done everything, not everything we can, but we try to be conscious of our language and try to make it as PG as possible. Yep. But then I was talking to some of my millennial friends a couple of days ago on the phone about some of the disturbing issues people were having with some of the podcast content. And they were like, oh man, I'm going to jump all over that then. I want to see that. I mean, what are your thoughts about how edgy these should be before they just get... I mean, does that turn more people off or is podcast land kind of like the Howard Stern show where that's why they tune in? Well, there are plenty of shows that are very intentional about being you know, rated for everybody. I would say that just the nature of the content of your show, there's probably an expectation or you should set that expectation that there could be sensitive, you know, kind of triggering material on any given show. You know, I would say that veterans who've been in theater and have had these experiences, if they're hearing someone recount something similar, that could be a possible, you know, triggering kind of event for them. But then I also think that it needs to be authentic, right? And if your interviewees are, are getting a little salty with the language, then, you know, that's just how that is. And you can flag certain episodes for adult content. But I think I would, you know, this is usually my recommendation is to just lead with authenticity. And so, you know, just trying to be as authentic as possible is the best place to start. You know, certainly you can you can bleep stuff out in post as well. And I know that there are a number of shows that do that. But, you know, I wouldn't flag something as safe for everybody if there is, you know, if there are some language challenges within that episode. Okay. Did that answer your question? 
Yeah, yeah, I think it did. And back to the podcast, I guess I'm thinking old school where if you had a sports talk show, you wouldn't, you'd never say anything about another sports talk show because you didn't want to cross promote them. Mm -hmm. I mean, is podcast land a little different that way? Are people a little more friendly when it comes to, quite frankly, you know, competing with other podcasts for viewership or listenership? How amenable would a podcast be to have in a potential upstart podcast, you know, being cross promoted on their show? Well, I think, again, it depends on the audience. And if they're bringing value to that audience, and it's aligned, then I think that certainly I can't speak for everybody. But I certainly think that that a lot of podcasters would be fine with that, because they know that they're bringing something valuable to the people who are listening to their show. And if they leak a few people to this other podcast, that's okay, because, you know, most people don't just listen to one show, you know, there's a, certainly a finite amount of time that most of us have to spend listening to podcasts. But it feels to me and again, I'm new in the community. But it feels to me that people are mostly pretty happy to help out and and, and, you know, a lot of times guests are hard to get. So it's fairly standard for people to come and pitch their book or their podcast or their business on the show. So that's not uncommon at all. Okay, that's good to know. I think we should take your advice and Ryan and I will huddle up afterwards and start trying to make these connections. I mean, it was just some random, e not random, but some emails to, you know, various news outlets that got us an interview with Fox 31. So maybe we could have a chance to cross promote our work on some other podcasts. And quite selfishly, some of these podcasters like Dan Carlin are amazing, kind of a groupie. And it would be an honor actually to be able to meet to meet some of these people and be on their podcasts. So yeah, I think that's a cool piece of advice that I hadn't thought of. I just figured that people didn't do that. Yeah, I feel like they do. There's certainly and I think we talked about this the other day, there's certainly some kind of podcast envelope, what umbrella companies that have a bunch of podcasts underneath and those guys tend to cross promote, you know, because they're all kind of in the same family. So I think of like iHeartRadio or it's under the Stuff You Should Know network, you know, there were a bunch of shows that kind of had a parent company. And so, you know, those guys obviously cross promote all the time and have have their friends and other podcasters on to be guests, etc. And those people usually pit, you know, promote their shows, even if they're theoretically competitive. You know, I, I do think that just getting out there and just trying to, you know, trying to get some more people to know that your show exists through the same medium that they're going to be using to listen to your show is, is important. And how important is a website for a podcast, not Facebook, but a standalone website? Well, I think a website is probably a fairly important tool to have, particularly if your podcast has the opportunity to really educate people. So one of the things that I think that your show would benefit from would be a site where you could list source material for some of your interjections. So people want to learn more about this event, they could go read that here. So show notes. Some people do like to listen to podcasts while they're sitting at their desk. I mean, the one thing that's nice about podcasting is that it's mobile. So, you know, someone can download it to their phone and go for a hike and listen, or they can listen while they're commuting, or if they want to listen, you know, either in the office or at home, you can do that through their computer or, you know, their home device, whatever that might be. So I think that having a website is part of that puzzle. And with your show, the opportunity to have that something that furthers the conversation is, I think, a valuable addition. Awesome. I've been bogarting this conversation. Ryan, you got any questions for Stu since we got him on the hook? No, I'm just taking it all in. Anything that he shares with us, I've been kind of jotting things down here and everything. So, you know, one of the things that Tony and I have kind of kicked around is the idea of bringing guest co-hosts on that may be authors, for instance. Tony and I both know a few people that have written books, and there are some people we have that we've interviewed that would may have been at, for instance, a POW camp that was is the expertise of a certain author. And, you know, one of the things we were going to try to do, you know, from a marketing standpoint would be to bring on an author like that. And they could be like a guest interviewer, kind of like how we're doing this now. And they participate in the podcast as the third person talking, you know, besides the veteran. And we, of course, plug their book. And so it's a win-win for everybody. You know, we get some exposure to their readers. And at the same time, they might get a shot in the arm with their book sales, too, by listening to us. Yeah, absolutely. 
Absolutely. I think that that'd be an amazing to give it a whirl. Yeah. The beauty of something new like this is that you can do whatever you want. And, you know, there are podcasts that are dedicated to learning languages and there are podcasts that are dedicated to talking smack about somebody. (laughs) You know, you can do whatever you want. And so it's really just blue sky in terms of what you can do. I would say if you have an idea, the other thing is, is it's relatively inexpensive to test that idea out and, you know, go ahead and go through the editing process and listen to it or run it by some people before you publish it. Mm. So I think that you can feel fairly you know, liberated in terms of how you approach all this stuff. And I haven't heard a bad idea yet. <laughs> so I would encourage you to continue to explore. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, so going on that, Stu, what are some of the most common mistakes you see people make when they're launching a podcast like this that kind of kills it? <laughs> well, I think the biggest mistake is not being committed to it. Mm-hmm. and thinking, oh, this will be fun. And they get through a couple episodes and, and peter out. Another thing that you have already tackled is, is getting some buffer. So, you know, for example, we're recording this episode on October 6th, and I think it will actually be live in sometime in December, perhaps even early 2022. So unintentionally got a little bit bigger buffer than I meant to. And I took some time off this summer to to try and alleviate that a little bit. But just having a buffer so that if something happens personally, or if you have an opportunity to go, you know, you have episodes in the can that you can drop and retain, you know, the schedule and that cadence that you've kind of committed to and you've gotten your audience used to. So I'd say that that tends to be one of the other big mistakes that people make is that they, you know, they're recording an episode this week without a lot of infrastructure and support that are recording an episode this week that's going to drop, you know, tomorrow or or next week. And then they're just constantly doing that. And so they're can always up against the timeline on things. You know, I'm just going to say that's one of the things that Tony and I talked about early on was if we're going to do this weekly, we're going to have to be able to record a whole slug of these every time we get together. And we need to make sure the quality is good. I mean, that would be a nightmare to me and it would be a job if I had to record a podcast that was going out next week, if I was under the gun and behind the eight ball that much that I had to worry about that. Cause then what I love right now, is if Tony and I get together and we record a series on a veteran in a weekend, if it sucks, we can go back and we've got time to re-record it and re-research things and be better prepared, for instance, if that is the case. And to not have that luxury and to feel like you're always under the gun to meet your schedule and not have that buffer would be very stressful, I think. Well, and I think that that then comes as your podcast grows and you start to bring on, you know, producers and you start to bring on people who are actually doing the research for you. You are also able to bring on people who are teeing up guests or, you know, for example, if you decide that you want to start to branch out and, and talk to Gulf War veterans, you can start to line up those interviews. And that's when you can start to play a little bit closer to those deadlines. That can be really nice because there's sometimes things that are very time sensitive that you'd like to be able to get out quickly. But in the absence of that infrastructure, I think that sticking with you know, giving yourself a comfortable buffer zone, you know, you both have full time jobs right now, and you know, stuff comes up. So you know, I think that continuing to have that buffer zone is important. Yeah, I I think if there's one thing that I would you heard Ryan and I chuckling over some of the things I said earlier, if there's one thing that I would love to be able to outsource right now, it would be the editing part. I mean, you know, Ryan and I, we love coming up with ideas, we love creating the content, you know, we love reaching out to other people. But right now, a lot of the editing is falling on Ryan's shoulders because he has kind of the production equipment in Tulsa for it. And we definitely like to spend less time doing that and more time producing content. So if this podcast ever does generate any sort of revenue at all, and right now it's not, which is fine. We're doing this because we enjoy it. Right. One of the first things we would do with that revenue is streamline the editing side so that it could even be be more fun than it is right now for us. We could spend more time on the creative stuff and less on, you know, the editing is really super, super important, but it can be tedious, I guess, is the word I'm looking for. Yeah, for sure. I think that looking for those opportunities for things that you either don't love as much or know you're not great at or some combination of those two, those are the first things to try and get off of your plate, particularly if they just open you up for the opportunity to do more of the stuff that you do love and are good at. 
Yeah, that would be great. I guess I got one more question for you. What's your comment on recording podcasts from distance versus having co-hosts working together? Can you sense through the production quality or the interaction you listen to podcasts from people who are in different states or countries versus people who are in the same studio? A lot of that you can take care of in post. You know, just making sure that everyone has decent equipment is certainly something to take into account. So full transparency, I have recorded one episode in the same room as the person I was interviewing. I started the show just over a year ago. This is my 70th episode that I recorded. Cool. And out of all of those, I have recorded one in person in terms of, you know, same room. And you need different equipment for that. And I have recorded a couple of episodes for other podcasts live, like in the same room. So thinking back about that, I have done that. But you need some specialized equipment to make sure that that works. So you need directional mics, you need splitters, you need all all sorts of things like that. So I have found for me that remote works fine. I think I don't have people saying that they don't like it. I know that the episode that I recorded in person is going to be a challenge for my team to edit because the room was fairly noisy in terms of just echoey and we weren't using the right kind of equipment. So it'll be fun to see how that one turns out. But I think it can be done either way. And I know of a lot of shows that were in-person shows with co-hosts that had to move to remote with co-hosts. And I think that they're comfortable both ways. And I didn't see a drop off in quality necessarily. You know, there's always a challenge with internet speed and equipment and things of that nature. So, you know, you just need to be able to roll, roll with those punches a little bit and have a backup plan. So this may sound like a rather archaic question, but have you ever recorded someone on a landline? Have you ever piped someone in on a landline rather than the internet or using their cell phone? I have not on my show. Definitely have been a guest where I dialed into a line and we just had a a phone conversation. And I'm not sure exactly. I don't know if they were doing some kind of multi-tracking on that or if, if it was just a single track. But, you know, it certainly can be done. You're going to get some quality differences in almost no matter what. You know, they're, everybody's using different equipment. So you're going to be tasked with that. But I think, again, if it's material is valuable and people enjoy it, that they'll kind of sit through anything. And if you have an episode that has some technical challenges, just letting people know at the onset that that's coming up and tee them up for it. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. Okay. It's been amazing. I've really had a good time talking with you guys all about podcasting. And I really look forward to seeing what's in store for you as you continue to roll this out. I'm really excited. We're, again, very grateful for the opportunity to have, you know, to be on someone else's podcast. This is all new to us. This is a first for us. Again, you were recommended highly from, you know, people in the Denver area who do podcasts and need assistance in that space. And uh, I'm looking forward to a follow on conversation on some of the ideas that you shared with us during the podcast. Absolutely. And so where should people go to find out more about the Warrior Next Door podcast or download episodes or get on your team? Sure. Yeah. So, you know, our podcast, The Warrior Next Door is on all the major podcast directories. It's on Apple, Spotify, Pandora, iHeartRadio, you know, uh, there's about 20 or so directories out there. You can just do a search for it and you should be able to pull it up on your device to listen to. And then we do have a Facebook page right now called the Warrior Next Door Podcast that you can go to watch the actual videos, the raw video from the veteran that's being featured at that time in our podcast series. I just uploaded the part one of the Harvey Hunt raw interview today to our Facebook page so that people can put a face with the voice of Harvey which was he's got that kind of grovelly Clint Eastwood voice, but better, I think. So that's the main thing. We do have the warriornextdoor.com as a website, but we have not built that out as a web page yet. But if you do click on it, it will take you to, you know, basically just a banner page with the episodes on it at this time, but nothing else really besides that. Perfect. One other quick thing is you might add YouTube to your channel list in terms of publishing either just the audio or if you have audio and video, posting that to YouTube as a channel as well. So that would be another thing that will help you guys spread that understanding or that that knowledge that the show exists. Great. I think that's a great idea. Yeah, yeah, we can definitely do that, especially since 
some of the videos are already being hosted on YouTube through Grand Valley State University, which is a partner of ours. I don't see any reason why we can't link to that or to our own videos that we upload ourselves. Yeah, for sure. I think that YouTube, you know, it's attached to Google. It has a huge audience. I think that you would, you know, see people engaging with the show over there as well. Okay, good idea. Well, thank you guys both for being on the show. It's been my pleasure to have you on. I'm really excited with how things are going and what's in store for you. And I love having conversations with people and talking through marketing and podcasting and hearing about their their experiences. But I really want to have people take action after listening to the shows. So I'm going to ask each of you what you would have people do if they had just listened to the show. For me, uh, two things. One is to put down their screens when they visit families this Thanksgiving or Christmas and actually talk to people in their family, especially if they're older than them, about, you know, how did their mom and dad meet? I'd be willing to bet a lot of kids don't know that. A lot of people don't know that about their parents or where they went to high school or what it was like growing up. And the second thing is, again, we got involved with being volunteer oral historians just because we had a passion for it. And for Ryan and I, Ryan and I have said this in the past, I think if either one of us did, were to think of these ideas separately, we probably wouldn't have got as much done. But together, when we paired up, we kind of became a force. So if you can share your passion with other people to help prompt you in action, whatever it takes, do it. I love it. How about you, Ryan? Yeah, I would agree to that. You know, that's one of the things that has really beneficial for me is having Tony on board. You can tell he's a infectious guy with respect to his energy and everything with myself actually you know looking at you know what would people do i mean i would just kind of echo that you know re preserving history your your own personal family history start there go out and sit down with your grandparents and find out how they grew up and what sort of trials and what sort of successes and failures they've gone through in their lives, you know, get more plugged in with your family to start with, you know, everybody has someone who is probably in the military. And even if they don't, your mom or your dad has got a story to tell. And, you know, I would just say the same thing as Tony, you know, preserving that history, even if it's just for yourself, and you can pass that down to your children and grandchildren. I think that's priceless. That's awesome. And one last thing, just to make it succinctly, I saw this in a commercial or heard it. It's awesome. Don't send your grandma an emoji. Go give her a hug. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, thank you both for being on the show. It was really great talking with you today. And keep up the good work. Thanks, Stu. We appreciate your help. Thanks, Stu. Yeah, look forward to working with you on this. All right. Bye. Okay, bye. And there you have it. Another great episode of Relish This. Thanks again for listening. You can find past episodes of the show at relishthis.org. And remember, if you liked what you heard today, please subscribe and leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts. For more information on purpose marketing, grab your free copy of my book, Mission Uncomfortable, How Nonprofits Can Embrace Purpose-Driven Marketing to Survive and Thrive. Get your copy now at missionuncomfortablebook.com.